What's up? Tether. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, what are like the trust assumptions that go into Tether? Who are you trusting? The issuer. The issuer? Okay, what does the issuer need? US dollars? Yeah. Okay, they need dollars. Where do they store them? In a bank account. Treasuries. Treasuries. Yep. Uh, yes. And what else do they need access to? Uh, fiat rails. Fiat rails. They need access to banks. Okay, yeah, so we've got Tether, right? Tether needs a bank, right? Bitfinex does. So, uh, what are the other options? Uh, can we get the lights now? Oh, I guess they're all out. Okay, yeah, if you guys go to my replit, then um, if you go to the replit for stable stats, then that's good to go too. And then this one, um, I'll just post this up here for a little bit as well, is if you go to codylo.github.io slash stable sats dash docs. Okay? Is the replit on your personal replit? I don't see it on the. Uh, I might have not hit publish on these things. So that is a very important thing that I should have done. Thank you very much for calling me out in front of this large audience. <laughs> All right. Uh, there you go. Publish. 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 Oh, it should be right on your homepage on Replit? Uh, yeah, you guys should be able to see it now. Hit refresh. The other way to see it is that I've got uh, ND book docs that I built a little while ago. Okay. So, how many of you do I know? Like, know my backstory, like where I was before as of Tuesday at Fetty. All right, so I was deep in the bowels of shitcoin land. Was, uh, I was an engineer at OKX. <laughs> and so, uh, once I got there, right, like being the Bitcoiner, I kind of show up and I like start introducing them to a lot of Bitcoin ideas. I start doing like weekly sessions with them of like, Hey, like a lot of these guys, they really didn't know what was happening in Bitcoin. Like none of them knew about Lightning, and a lot of them, the moment they see it, is they're like, "Oh, wait a second, this means you don't need a blockchain for all this other crap." And I was like, "Yeah, that's the point, duh, right?" And so, um, as I'm talking to them, I'm talking about, "Hey, these are some of the problems with banks. Something Tether, right?" So who said Tether needs a bank? Who's the one who pointed that out? You, right? Excellent point, right? Is that Tether needs a bank, right? And if they need a bank, then that bank can be censored. And so when we started seeing some of these things collapse, and we started saying like, "Oh, hey." Like Silvergate looks like it's gonna go down. Well then a lot of people in the company start going, oh hey, well we'll just move to Signet, that's fine. I'm like, no, this is not like where do we go next? It's this is not from like one to two, this is going from one to zero. We're going to hit a point where we're not gonna have access to banks anywhere up or down the stack, right? And so just because we personally don't have access to banks, uh, am I talking too loud, by the way? No, I can no. pull it down. Okay, so just because we personally don't have access to banks, people are like, oh hey, I'll hold it in stable coins. But what percent of USDC was held at Silicon Valley Bank? 8%. 8%. What happened to the peg? It went down by like 20%, right? So, without the good graces of the US government coming in and bailing out a bunch of people who don't know how to manage risk, right? Stable coins are not stable. Stable coins are not something that you can trust. You are trusting the banking relationship and the bank can be censored, right? So the question becomes, how do we have stability in Bitcoin without having to trust the bank anywhere up or down the stack? I am like in the global south, I can't get KYC in order to get access to a bank account, right? Like if you guys remember, like one of Jack Mahler's talks was like one of the things that brought me to Bitcoin, right? When he announces El Salvador, is he's talking to some of his friends, uh, like Chimbera, right? And he's like, hey, like I'm a fisherman in El Salvador. I can't get a Chase bank account. I can't get access to complex financial uh, uh, instruments, right? Like I'm not like you, right? Bitcoin is our opportunity to break down those barriers. So why do we have to keep trusting banks? Why do we have to keep relying on them? There's like 4 billion people that can't get access to these like horrible, censorable things where the moment you put it in there, they just lend it out and you're an unsecured creditor, right? So while I was at OKX, I was like, hey, let's look, start looking at some of these options for these ones. And I came across stable stats. Stable stats is, oh, it's not working. It was. Whatever, if you guys can just make sure that you've got the docs open, either on like codylo.github.io slash stable stats dash docs, or the REPL, it's got like some of the stuff over. I don't think the code runs because I've been like running around helping other people, I couldn't debug my own stuff. Um, so I came across stable sats, right? And so stable sats is a mechanism to get US dollar stability without touching a bank anywhere up or down the stack, okay? So who thinks they have an idea of how that might work? And if you work at Galloid, please don't be that guy. <laughs> I've seen it before, so. Oh, uh, that's fine, yeah, ex yeah, explain for the audience. It, it seems like you're neutralizing the price volatility by long and short. Yeah, so. Like a lot of the solutions for getting US dollars is like actually having a US dollar, right? But 
why do I want a US dollar? Like, I actually don't want it. Like, it's actually kind of gross. It's like hemp paper. Like, a lot of it's got, like, cocaine all over it and stuff. Like, they're pretty gross, actually. Like, I don't want to touch those things. And so what I want is I want the US dollar price stability, right? And while for us, living in the United States, we see the inflation going off like this, but if I'm in Lebanon and it's like a 1,000% inflation every month, right? If I'm in Argentina and the value of my currency has gone down from, like, one peso to one dollar to now it's, like, 300 pesos to the dollar, and the, like the uh, official rate for that is like at one third of it if I actually go through a government approved institution, right? Is like, you know, the US dollar st price stability is pretty good. And so like Paul as like our resident economics uh, um, expert over here, right? Is that what is money the solution to? The coincidence of? Yes, right. And so what do we want to do if we're like running a business, right? Like we're using it as our unit of account, right? Like do I, if I have to pay expenses in dollars, it's the global reserve currency, right? Do I want to get paid in something that moves differently that I have to unit, do a different unit account for? Awesome. See, this is why he's the GOAT. So, <laughs> cool. So I need ability, if I'm using Bitcoin, to peg the price of dollars. And the reason why is because if I'm running a business, if I like actually start using Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis on medium exchange, like the complexity of hey, I accept Bitcoin, the price goes down by 5% tomorrow, and I can't make payroll, right? And so this is one of the really cool things that Galloway figured out of running the, the it's called Blink now, right? But the Bitcoin Beach wallet, I'm gonna like OG it, right? Is that basically the killer app for getting people to adopt Bitcoin is to not show them it's Bitcoin. It's to give them experience of like, they receive Bitcoin and it's stored in their uh, wallet as Lightning, as um, USDs, right? And the way that they do that is not by holding USD. You do not need a bank account for this strategy, okay? We're gonna do is that I'm gonna take some of my Bitcoin. It's really annoying. Yeah. So this is Rust code that you guys can see. Like I don't, I didn't think I debugged it, right? But basically, the idea behind this, right, is that I don't actually have to hold dollars. I have to hold two things, which in aggregate act like a dollar, right? And so let's say that I've got, you know, like Bitcoin. And then I short a perpetual, uh, I buy a perpetual inverse swap, which is I'm shorting the price of Bitcoin in, a, in an unleveraged way, right? Or you can do it up to two like something, which is fine, okay? So I, I hold two, these two things, right? So that you give me some Bitcoin, I take 40% of it, and I open a downside hedge on like a crypto exchange, like OKX, Bitfinex, Binance, whatever, right? Anything that offers a coin margin derivative, okay? If the price of Bitcoin goes up, the Bitcoin goes up, the hedge goes down in value, when I close the position, the amount of Bitcoin that I get at the end will be the same US dollar value as when I started. It's really, really important that you guys understand this. So like, please go through the map. I've got the map uh, in the tutorials over there. Let me not understand this relationship. Is that I hold two different assets and they move inversely. So if one goes up, the other goes down. And so the aggregate price between the two remain the same. You just go into what a swap is on an exchange? Yeah, so basically, um, like Arthur Hayes figured out that you want to do like these perpetual, so basically I could, uh, what's your name? Okay. What's your name? Randy. Randy, right? So I could go to Randy and I could just buy some Bitcoin off him, right? Or we could come up with a derivative. And a derivative is just like some agreement over financializing an asset. If we say, in the future, I will deliver Bitcoin to you at some price, right? So I say, one month from now, I will deliver to you 30, a Bitcoin and you will give to me $30,000, right? So now, even if the price of Bitcoin moves in the short term, I know that I have to have one Bitcoin and in a month from now, I will give it to him and he will give me $30,000. So the way that most crypto, uh, like coin margins, derivatives tradings work on all of these exchanges work is they use perpetual swaps, right? So I said that was a month duration for that swap that I was doing uh, with him for that future. Who, who can tell me what a perpetual is, a perpetual swap? Uh, never, never expires. Never expires. Okay, so how if it if he never actually delivers me the coin, how does that work? Uh, I will need to, I mean, pay if I'm losing or I will receive. Yeah, you're gonna have to post margin, right? And you're gonna have to basically be financing that derivative instrument during the uh, day. So like every couple of eight hours, it depends on the exchange you go to or whatever. But like every eight hours, you have to post up a little bit more Bitcoin or whatever to keep the position open. Okay, but it's a way you never actually settle. It's just this is just a derivative instrument that me and Tony have agreed that we're going to do this thing, okay? Like posting collateral, I'm keeping that good. Yeah, is that I, at some point in the future, you will deliver me Bitcoin of $30,000, and in order to keep this derivative relationship open, in order for you to not close me out, I keep posting margin every once in a while, right? And if the price goes down, because 
Now, if I say, hey, I'm gonna deliver you uh, Bitcoin at $30,000 or whatever, let's say the price of Bitcoin goes to $60,000. Does the price of my derivative, that relationship that I have, does the price of that go up or down? Up. Why? Because you're getting kind of half price. Yeah, right? So like, who would be willing to buy from me the right to get Bitcoin at $30,000? when the price of Bitcoin is $60,000. Everybody, right? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Bob. Okay, so this is kind of the idea, right? So now, instead of a perpetual swap, we're gonna have a perpetual inverse swap. So what does that mean? Who can tell me? Price is inverse. Price is inverse. So if the price of Bitcoin goes up, the price of this hedging instrument goes <coughs> down. Okay, so if the price of, invo if the price of uh, Bitcoin continues to go up. Now, this is like where the magic of stable stats comes in, okay? So I originally opened it, let's just even the numbers out. You actually don't have to do this this way. You can also use a little bit of leverage for it. But let's say I open up the position originally. I've got half of it in, when you deposit to me 200,000 sats, I take 100,000 sats and I put that to the side over here. This is the one side of it. And I take the other 100,000 sats and I open up the hedging position, okay? So now the price of Bitcoin goes up. What's, what happened to the derivative? Perpetual inverse swap went down. down. Okay, now if you're holding that side of the contract from me, what are you gonna ask for me? The, th the thing that you're holding for me, the price of that just went down. What are you gonna want me to do? What is that, Paul? Send, send money. Why do I have to send more money? The, well, you have the, the other one, which is all the stats you want, it's gonna go up in value, and the goal of this whole scheme is to have the same amount of value at all points in time. So you can take a little bit from that pile and give it to the other person. Exactly. The same amount exactly, right? And so I take my stats that I have over here, and then I use it to cover as the price of the inverse goes down, okay? Now what I'm doing is I'm like meeting margin as I do this thing, okay? When they deliver it, they don't give me all the stats back at the end of it. They give me the price at which I sell it. And so at the end of the day, if I had 200,000 at the beginning and that was worth $100, if the price of Bitcoin goes to the moon, right? Which, thank God it will, yes? There we go. Is <laughs> that, at the end of the day, I'm still keeping that short open and so I've moved like 90,000 sats from my 100,000 that I had over here into the hedging position. And then when I close it out, let's say that I end up with like 10,000 sats out of that position that I had or whatever, right? So now at the end of the day, when I close these two positions, the price of Bitcoin has gone to the moon, but the relative value of those positions is that I basically moved all those out of custody over there into the, uh, into the margin account. And when I close that out, I end up with 20,000 sats, which is the same value in USD as when I started. Okay, I'm like kind of going back and forth a lot of this stuff. Like a lot of this is in the docs that I have for there. Okay, and I'm like, I really, it's really, really important that you understand this hedging mechanism for it. This is the way this whole thing works. Okay, so what is the advantage? Yep. That's not a question, it's more of a comment. We started off saying that the main drivers for this thing were the people not having access to financial, whether an ID or a bank account. Specifically a bank account. A bank account, exactly. That means you know what I mean. Yep. You need to, you need eventually to uh, see for this in exchange. The government more can tell, okay, yeah, it's like, well, you cannot be pulling these funds and open these positions on behalf of people. Right? There is there is a risk there. Yep. And the second risk is the exchange going bust, you not just in the bank, but just in the exchange. Okay, so more guys. Yep, absolutely. And this is where, like, I wanted that argument. So, like, I was going to, like, walk around and, like, pay some stats on my phone or whatever, but, like, we'll do that later. Is that, so, this is like a trade-off for this stuff, right? Is that this is not self-custody Bitcoin. This is a risk. This is when you put these things in this position, if the price of Bitcoin continues to go to, the, uh, go to the moon, right? And you can't close that position, or if the price of Bitcoin goes down and you can't close that position or whatever, this is a risk when you're doing these things, okay? But there's like a couple of significant advantages of this, and this is why Galloway did this themselves for this stuff, right? Is that this operation works extremely well for a custodial service to offer USD to their clients. Right? And so for Galloy, as like a Bitcoin bank in El Salvador, like because the, basically the, the size of these contracts is basically $100 increments or whatever, you basically have to keep like a target hedge position for this margin. And it's in, like, it's, uh, it's in units of $100, right? And so while working this as an individual doesn't really work very well, right? But if you are a custodian, if you are doing this, this is something that you could offer users and it is a risk in the way that you're doing these things or whatever, right? But the important part is that from my perspective on this one, and I'm happy to be corrected on these ones, is that I think they're coming for all the bank accounts. And this does not require a bank account up or down the stack. Yeah. Right? And if for the. Well, some custodians, right? But like other custodians get them taken away, right? I mean, that happens all the time. 
right? Yep. Is it more interest, more bank, or exchange? Yeah, that's a huge question. I mean, like personally, having like known people who had their money in First Republic and SVB and all that kind of stuff, and like I know for certain exchanges, and like you know, not speaking to any specific one, <coughs> FTX, is that like you know they're lending out on the back end the same way the banks do, but the, the business model of the bank is that there is no money in the bank, right? And so on the exchange, at least they can do some proof of reserves, they can do whatever, right? Of like you know, it's this interesting set of trade offs that I think is worth exploring for this stuff. Is the way I um, think about it. And yep. I think you know, this is what I was, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And you can you can use this same logic of you just need Bitcoin and a place to trade it, right? Is that currently the way stable sets works is that it only operates against um, OKX. But if you go on the GitHub right now, they have pull requests for support for four more exchanges and position sizing across those different exchanges, right? To hedge the risk out. And theoretically, once DeFi pools get big enough, and you can get the execution uh, execution costs to go down, because the problem is like if you execute this on Uniswap or whatever, like every time you adjust the trade position, you lose five percent, right? It's like you need the sort of the centralized market maker in order to get like the good execution price on the hedging, right? But like there's nothing to stop you from using this against a DeFi pool, right? And when, when you get into the code for stable stats, you're going to see that the way they've built this is such that there's literally four lines of code that you need to change in order to point this at something else. And that's gonna be like the remainder of the talk after this like brief introduction or whatever, of that like, I think I've already set the table for all of this. If any of you guys wanna work on this hackathon project, you need to change exactly four lines of code in order to plug this into LND, in order to plug this into Core Lightning, in order to make this a Fediment module, in order to plug this against like a normal Bit, uh, Bitcoin core node, right? Like it's literally like the way that they've built this, uh, like shout out to Jeff, Justin Carter, right? CTO of Galloway, is that They've made this incredibly modular, and you can point this against anything you want. And so, like the vision that I have in my head is that there is a ton and a ton of like large core lightning nodes, fediments, all of these things or whatever, and all of them are like doing this strategy where I send uh, I send some Bitcoin to Carmen. He opens up the hedge on the backside, right? So he receives dollars. He closes the position to send the Bitcoin to somebody else. They receive dollars, right? And like I see you nodding along, right? Because Open Node does something very similar, but on the bank account side. Hopefully you could like hack this into open notice like an alternative in the event that your bank's got shut off. Yeah. in this line, two points, right? One, there's the trading of counterparties, right? Like you're basically substituting a counterparty where theoretically you're at lower regulatory risk, yep. or higher solvency risk. Mm -hmm. um, the other is hacking, you know, we're not smart enough to figure this out. So then you might have to go from a funding from a funding cost point of view, right? With stable stats or the retro swap we're introducing that. Value yep, totally. So, whole having that stable sat for one week costs there because you have to pay the ego ratio. Yep, one exactly. Week. Yeah, so how do you think, just how do you think about that? And how valuable is it to onboard somebody to Bitcoin without having them pro exposed to price stability? Yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. Just general question. How much easier would it be to onboard people to Bitcoin if they were not exposed to price stability, in, um, price, price movements? I mean, or if they're using Wallet of Satoshi, are they on Bitcoin? No. Well, that, no, that's like one way to think about it, right? Or another way to think about it is that it's an intermediate step for this. Again, I don't think this is like the end-all be-all solution. I think this is an interesting set of trade-offs which is worth exploring. And the way that they built this is such that literally over this weekend, if you guys want to, you can hack this into whatever project you want, okay? So let's jump into here and let's actually look at the stable sets code. So, I got this somewhere, right? Yep, there we go. Cool. Uh, not my main.rs. Let's actually just go to the tutorial because I've got everything in there. Okay. So if you guys can follow along with me on the tutorial, I'll call this out. So we go to this next one. Uh, Alice and Bobby example, I kind of already went through that, that's fine. Uh, synthetic USD and perpetual swaps, that just goes to the math. I already talked about that and risks and all those kinds of things. Take a note uh, from Paul's blog is that you also want to be upfront about the risks in these things and like address them in stride as you're going. Okay, uh, Okay. so here we go. Decoupling the Galloway backend. Okay, so as of right now, stable stats is what they use in order to US dollar balances for all of the Bitcoin Beach wallet stuff. Okay, but the way that they built it is ex extremely modular. And there's exactly two points of coupling between stable sets and the Galloway backend. And if you decouple those and point them at something else, then just out of the box, you don't have to touch any of the hedging logic, you don't have to touch anything else, you just load an OKX API key, point it at whatever you want, and you have a USD balance associated with that Bitcoin node. Okay? The two points of coupling are the target USD liability, 
which is the accounting source of truth for how much USD stable SAS hedging is responsible for, is responsible for, and the Bitcoin wallet, is you need a way to deposit to the exchange and to withdraw. You guys are using Collider. Collider has an integration with stable SAS for that one. You can do it over Lightning. Okay, X and most of the other exchanges, they require just like an on-chain deposit, okay? So the way that the current architecture works for stable SATs, and you guys have this clone down in the repo, it's stable SATs to SRS, okay? Is that Gallo client has the backend Bitcoin wallet that we're gonna be decoupling the Gallo specific implementation from. Then there's hedging and ledger, core hedging business logic, and the Postgres accounting. And we're gonna go really deep into the ledger system that they have, because basically they built an out of the box, spit out from Rust code, gap compliant double entry accounting for the stable size module. And so whatever node you decide to kick this out of, all of the hedging trades that you do, you spit out gap compliant, double entry bookkeeping for all of this strategy. Okay? What is gap? G-A-A-P, general accounting, what's it? Generally, generally accepted accounting principles, right? It's like, you know, if like Gary finally gets off his butt and goes after all these securities or whatever, and he finally comes to Bitcoin and he addresses like, no, we're not a security. One of the things he's going to accept from companies from companies that are securities is that they give him gap compliant accounting standards. Right? So, cool. Um, then you've got the OKX client and the OKX price, right? Is that you need a price oracle, right? For like, because uh, the because um, the hedging module needs to know like, hey, this is the price based off of my US target USD liability and based off of my current position sizing. I need to either add margin or remove margin, right? When you when you, when you say oracle, you mean like it's sign it is like. You have signed. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that OKX signs their prices, and so they do. Okay. Yeah, right. But um, I know that some of the other exchanges do, and so they just they, they only use OKX right now just because they're not based in the United States, and so they're able to get API keys for it well. Right. And it's like you know it's the second largest one. And again, like the big problem for this one is that like so the hedging logic here it doesn't automatically adjust all of these things. It just keeps like a target hedging liability, so it's like very close, right? And this is why it works for a larger custodian where you can just like spread it across a lot of people, right? But for, um, wait, where are we going with this? I totally lost myself. I'm gonna continue with the price server. And so <laughs> so um, price server is a Redis pub slug for the pricing info, right? And so you, they're also, um, there's pull requests to open for splitting the pricing info across another, and you can like weight them differently depending on who they are, right? And so like if one falls out, then it adjusts the weights dynamically in order for you to like get a more accurate price feed. And then there's this user trades module. I'm sorry, uh, user trades trade. This is the source of truth for the target USD liability, and it's the hardest part to decouple from Gallo, so it's what we're gonna do first, okay? So, and then I've got like steps below here for how to run it with Docker, how to run it with Nix, right? Cool, so getting the target USD liability, right? And this is number five in the tutorial if you guys wanna follow along. Getting the target USD liability, so, how it currently works is that they pull for the USD liability from the user trades module. So the stable stats ac application architecture uses Postgres tables for its double entry accounting ledger, uses Rust SQLX query builder library along with domain logic from SQLX MQ, which is just like a way that um, if I could like make multiple, they're designing this so that you could run it at like a company level, right? So they want it to be like highly available, run across multiple instances and stuff. This is basically just a way so that when you're getting like the prices or whatever, like if, you have, if you're running 16 instances of this, of this thing, is that it splits out the jobs across those 16, right? So it's not like every 10 seconds, it's getting all 16. It's like every 10 seconds, this one gets it, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. It's just like a way to order the jobs, okay? Um, this is the job pattern of doing this job queue thing. It's like all across the code base. You're gonna see it everywhere. So the way that they get the target USD liability is they basically got a Postgres table and it's got user trades, and there's a super user inside of there called dealer, right? And as Paul likes to use in some of his examples too, is that the dealer is like a super user. He's like the, the guy who's kind of like got super knowledge of everything and that sort of thing. And so the dealer is every time that I want to, like if I'm as a user, I accept Bitcoin and I want to accept it as USD, right? Then the user trade for that one is that the user is selling Bitcoin and buying USD. That's the way that it's recorded, right? In terms of the bookkeeping for it. And basically, the aggregate of all of the dealer's trades, the aggregate of his negative exposure in terms of USD, so when they buy USD, they buy it from the dealer. The dealer is like this aggregate user in this table, and you say like, all, his, all of the USD price exposure comes from querying this single dealer guy on the table. 
Does that make sense? This is just, it's kind of an anti-pattern. Like, this is probably not the best way to do it. It does make it easier for plugging this into other stuff, right? Because basically, you just have to, whenever you want to do a USD liability, you just have to update the dealer's entry in the Postgres table, right? Remember, there's two things that we need. We need a target USD liability, right? So like, how much Bitcoin do I have? How much of that is uh, hedged to dollars right now? And we need a way to move Bitcoin on and off the exchange. Those are the only two things that are coupled to Galloway right now that you have to uncouple and point to something else. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. So there's two transactions for each trade. So that when a Galloway bank user, Alice, wants to move money to the synthetic USD account, two transactions show up in the table under the dealer. The dealer receives Bitcoin from Alice, and the dealer sends synthetic USD to Alice. Right? So like Alice sells Bitcoin and then buys dollars. The, like the dealer receives Bitcoin and sends dollars. The receiving Bitcoin is Alice locking in a USD price with some Bitcoin. The sending USD is crediting Alice with the equivalent USD value of that locked Bitcoin at the time she locks it. The logic here needs to correlate the receiving Bitcoin and sending USD to make sure they match up. So it has to identify what the price of Bitcoin was at the time that Alice locked it. Okay? So like all of this is kind of handled for you already, but it's just the only thing you need to change if you're going to plug this into your own, uh, like a FedMe module or a Core Lightning plugin or like a Lightning uh, LND extension or whatever, is that you need to add something here, whether you're getting the target U USD liability for someone called dealer in this Postgres table. There's a negative dealer USD balance and a positive dealer Bitcoin balance, right? Because it's like the dealer is the guy who I owe USD to these people. This is how much Bitcoin I have. So then there's polling logic, right? So this is the um, SQL XMQ stuff I was talking about, right? Of like these jobs. Like you'll see that this is all Rust code, right? And so it's decorated with that. So these poll gallery transactions over here. We go down. It says like, hey, execute, right? So it's like let gallery transactions equal there's new gallery transactions you're getting from the pool. You're executing this one based on that. It's if has more, spawn poll gallery transactions, current job dot pool duration from sex away. Else, spawn gallery transactions, do this delay, and then away. Right? There's nothing to get that stuff. But you don't have to really change, really change anything right there. The important part is the gallery transactions execute function. There's three subsections of this. Okay? So who can tell me what the three subsections are without looking at the tutorial? There's three things that are happening there. Transactions, trades, and live trades. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you're importing transa gallery transactions, right? And this is saying, hey, are there more or less transactions from the last time that I tried? Has anything changed? Has somebody withdrawn Bitcoin or has somebody deposited Bitcoin? Has somebody changed their USD exposure? Okay. Update user trades. What does this one do? So there's a crate called user trades that does something. If you discover new transactions, those. You're writing them to your ledger, right? Well, you're writing them to your table, and then you're writing them to double entry bookkeeping ledger. Okay? Yeah, that's what that one's doing. What's update user trades? Uh, update user trades is basically like a it's like an intermediate Postgres table before you go to the ledger, right? The ledger is the gap double entry bookkeeping, right? Like the intermediate uh, the intermediate table is kind of like a staging table between these two, right? So you just kind of walk through all those, so you don't have to do that stuff. Here we go, update user trades, right? So this checks for eventual, we don't have to get into this. Um, here we go, update ledger. This is like the interesting part, okay? So just as the import table has a flag for whether the transaction's been matched, so in the, in the user trades thing, like the intermediate table, it's matching the buying and the selling, right? Of like, a, hey, this person deposited Bitcoin and the dealer gave them dollars or whatever. You have to match those, and make sure that they align. The user trades table has a flag for whether the transaction's been accounted for in the ledger system. So before this is called, the new transactions haven't been accounted for yet, and the accounting of the user trades table is what's needed to hand it off to the hedging. There's another part made pretty complicated about high availability architecture, but whatever. Uh, we can keep going with this one. So this one's update ledger. So here we go over here. So we find the unaccounted for trades within the ledger. If it's a buy unit, we do this thing. User buys USD. So this is, hey, the target USD liability of the dealer has increased. And so write to the ledger that the dealer has received Bitcoin and gives a USD uh, credit, uh, gives a USD claim. Else, the user sells USD. 
somebody has like sent, done a lightning payment or whatever, and so they've given back the USD claim that they had, and you sent like uh, sent Bitcoin. So you're writing these to the ledger, okay? Those two things: user buys USD, and user sells USD. Those are the only two things that can happen. Okay, what's up? So I have a, I have a diagram of my phone here. This is basically a digital process. It's trying to You have the process variable, which which is the current price. <laughs> Nifty, I'm doing okay. <laughs> okay. So, so in control theory, you sample and then you make adjustments. So that's effectively what you're doing. You're yeah. Sampling the process variable, which is the current price of Bitcoin. Precisely. US dollars. And the, so yep. And all of that hedging logic is already implemented, and you don't have to touch any of it. Right. And the, and the control variable is actually what um, it is the trades that you're making. It's effectively your ledger state. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so here's the question. How do we decouple this user trades module from the Galloway backend? Do you have to adjust everything from whole Galloway transactions up to this update ledger loop? That you have to change so that it's getting the USD liability from somewhere else, right? I think the easiest way to do it is to just like literally create something called a dealer and just like update that single row within the existing user trades table that they already have. But you can do whatever you want for this one. The thing that you need to do is just Marshal whatever you have such that you can pass it into and it passes Rice Rust type checking system where user buys USD and user sells USD. Because what this is going to do is it's going to do the double entry bookkeeping and the hedging logic is literally just monitoring, it's, it's literally just monitoring that ledger. And when there's a change in the ledger, it adjusts the hedging and you don't have to touch any of the logic. Does that make sense, everybody? You don't have to touch anything on the hedging, you don't have to implement any of that code, it's all done. The only thing you need to do is you need to update the target USD liability by changing these two functions. User sells USD, and user buys USD. So you need to pass in a transaction, you need to create a ledger transaction ID, you have to put the buy parameters or the sell parameters or whatever, which is just like the Satoshi's amount, the USD cents amount, and some metadata. That's all you need to do. So for whatever you do, you can point this at an LDK node, point this at a Bitcoin Core node, point this to whatever you want, like you can point this at a web app or whatever. You just marshal it into this format it writes it to the ledger. Don't touch anything in the ledger. Don't touch anything in the hedging. And all of that will be just be done for you. And you will have a stable USD liability. Okay? Do you know, like, is it just like constantly reading the Postgres database? Uh, yeah, so it's um, basically it's just like event driven, right? And so I was like, hey, when there's an update to this uh, Postgres one, then it's like puts it in the form of jobs for uh, the SQL execute. Right? Cool. So recap if you want to do this, and like implement this yourself, copy the 20 lines of codes in that whole Galloway transactions.rs update ledger loop around ledger .us, uh, user buys USD and user sells USD, put them in a different module, get the necessary USD liability and Bitcoin balance information from your backend and fit it into the type structure. Like if you do that, then whatever you decide to point that at, everything else works. You don't have to change anything. There's no hedging logic changes, nothing else, okay? And I said the Rust compiler would be your friend here, right? Like, who got Rust filled at the end of that little thing that we did? Yes? No? Hopefully everybody. It's the correct way to code? Okay. Okay, so decoupling the ledger module to still use the hedging module. So the user trades module gets the BTC USD transactions to create a target USD liability from some backend and accounts for them in the ledger module using this loop. This is the one that I showed you before, right? User buys USD, user sells USD. And this is kind of just like a little diversion over here, just to like see like the really cool accounting software that they made for this stuff. Ledger.us user buys USD looks like this. Post transaction in TX. TX ID, user, user buys USD code, and then params. The ledger create and stable stats is a facade pattern wrapper around Gallery Money's double sided bookkeeping library, SQL X Ledger. You can see the documentation there. It works with templates and it's very generic. So here's like the core of the template for user buys USD. So who here knows some accounting stuff? You can kind of walk me through this code. Accounting, cool. So here we've got entries is a vector of entry inputs. So this entry type, what does it say? USD BTC credit. Yes, 
currency is BTC. The account ID is the StableSats Bitcoin wallet ID. So this is like the, the, the dealer's Bitcoin account. Direction is credit. Layer is settled. Units, frames, Bitcoin amount. You build it and you have an expect, right? So this is just like error handling and rust. There's a, so that's one entry. Uh, user buys USD Bitcoin credit. What's the second one? USD BTC capital. Yes, right? Double entry. There's two more. USD, USD credit? Yes, so there's two entries for the Bitcoin side, there's two entries for the USD side, right? So this is just this template builder. So this is actually Bitcoin independent. You can just use this software if you want to do like gap compliant accounting standards for whatever you want, whatever Rust code you have. So any Rust financial application that you have, you can use this SQL X ledger crate that they made in order to um, spit it out. And so this is the template that you build off of this one and it'll export through logs, um, what's it called? Like literally gap compliant accounting standards that you can just like import into a uh, CSV, right? So pretty, pretty sweet stuff. Okay, so where the ledger is being used in the hedging module. The hedging <laughs> module has an OKX engine and hedging source OKX engine RS, which is right here. Hedging source OKX engine.rs, okay? Which has a handle on the ledger's event stream. It's not a one to one match between user USD trades being placed in the hedging updating position because, like, the users, they might be doing lightning payments or whatever, or doing zaps or something like that, right? And so, you know, if like I have like a, if I have to do the hedging in $100 increments, and somebody's sending like 10 cents, whatever, right? Like I don't need to adjust the hedge for that one, right? But if someone withdraws a bunch of Bitcoin, or like maybe 50 people do like $10 payments at the same time, then maybe I have to adjust the hedge. All that hedging logic is already implemented, you don't have to touch anything, <coughs> right? All you have to do is write to the ledger, and the ledger has an event stream that is uh, being subscribed to by the um, hedging module, right? And it'll handle it all, okay? Over here, OKX okay, engine, does OKX okay, engine run? You go over here, it says, like, hey, OKX okay, client, these are the orders, these are the transfers. Check the leverage position, right? Get the funding adjustment. So the funding adjustment is based off of, hey, do I need to do a funding adjustment here? Do I need to do a hedging adjustment here? And then the return value for this is based off of those, do I need to hedge or do I need to adjust in some way, right? And so we can kind of skip this stuff right here. A lot there. Okay, so that's kind of like a deep dive into like the ledger system, and we've uncoupled the USD balance. Okay, the only thing left to do is to decouple the Bitcoin wallet. So the Bitcoin wallet operates in this adjust funding job. Okay, so what is adjusting funding for this margin position? Posting more collateral or Receiving, right? So it's like, hey, the price of Bitcoin goes down, the price of the hedge has gone up. I don't need to have as much collateral on the exchange. I can keep it there, but I would prefer to keep it as much to myself as I could, right? So the Bitcoin wallet's used here. And this execute, just ignore this stuff. Matches action, an OKX funding adjustment, do nothing, returns nothing. Otherwise, match action. This is actually not a very clean pattern right here. OKX funding adjustment. You need to deposit the Bitcoin. You get a deposit address from OKX. This is like some ledger stuff. And then down here, this line of code touches the Bitcoin wallet. This is the line of code that you're gonna have to change. Okay? This uses Galloway's like roll their own backends. Like he works at Galloway, so keep bringing it up. All right, so he can probably help you out with this, right? It's just send an on-chain payment, right? It's just like take the deposit address, how much to send, put a memo, and I think this is like, uh, I don't know what this one's for, but I don't want to know that guy yet. What? The block target, maybe? Yeah, probably. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. See, this is why Ben's like the big thing. Right? What happens if you don't post the collateral on time to the block time or something? Uh, that's a risk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like get liquidated. Right? Which is why Collider is even <laughs> which is why Collider is better because you can do the lightning payment and you do the instant settlement mm -hmm. between it. Right? Doesn't OK Coin have lightning support? Uh OK Coin does, okay X does not. Yeah. Do they both offer ten to one leverage? Uh no, okay, X does, okay, coin does not. <laughs> Collider does. Uh Collider is a separate business. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, so this touches the Bitcoin wallet, right? This is the other line of code that touches the Bitcoin wallet. Get an on-chain address. 
Let's change this line and this line, and the code will just work for the Bitcoin wallet. Okay? Now, the way that I recommend that you do this is by implementing a wallet client trait with those two functions. Right? Now, yeah, the on chain address, and send on chain payment. Who your code's Rust? Yeah, yeah. Okay, why is the trait the best way to do this? You can make multiple, you can set the same functions and they'll port it everywhere. If you implement this as a trait, what could you do? If I wanted to not just use this with Gala. Oh, you could, yeah, use it for other. Uh... You could have like Galway implement the trade, you could have like Muni implement the trade, you could have Bitcoin Core implement the trade, and then just. I think the big one is BDK. Yeah. So that BDK <coughs> is a Rust native Bitcoin library, which is super, super developer friendly and super approachable. And all you'd have to do to get a separate Bitcoin wallet that's not Galloy's for as part of your hackathon project is implement these two functions as a trait for BDK. Right? And I think they already have this one. <laughs> They definitely already have this one. You know, they have both. I just have to wrap the existing functionality around these ones, right? Like, Carmen, you got 10 minutes. Let's see if you can do that huge VDK sometimes, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like, this would take you like 15 minutes, probably. Another example of probably that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so to update the execute function using this trait, this is like, you know, this doesn't like work yet, right? But this is kind of what it would look like. Is that C, instead of taking Galloy, it just takes wallet with W, and execute is W is anything that implements the wallet client trait. <coughs> and then down here, it says wallet.send on chain payment. And this one says wallet.on chain address. Right? If you make those lines of code changes to this project and you implement that wallet trait for whatever else you want to point it out, so you could do a Bitcoin core node, you could do BTCD, you could do BDK, you could do Electrum, you could do whatever you want, right? You can attack and you Fix this, and you fix the ledger side of things, you can have a USD balance associated with any Bitcoin node. Right? So I think this is a big deal of like something interesting to explore in the design space of possible solutions for when, not if, they cut off our banking access. Right? Because there's no bank up or down the stack for this one. And so as DeFi gets bigger, right? Like DeFi, like as much as I hate crypto or whatever, right? Like it would be nice to not have to go to your centralized custodian for the trading of these things. You don't have to touch anything in terms of the uh, trading strategies for this stuff. You just point the hedging module at that different DeFi pool, right? Like I think this is a really, really interesting design space for how do you give USD liabilities to Bitcoin users without touching banks. How do like user accounts work at all? Registration with the with the pools that you pointed to, right? Who's doing the KYC for that? So for this one, for every, is, is every so for this, so let's like, ignore the DeFi stuff because we're not doing that right now. Now it's just using OKX, right? And eventually it's using like Bitfinex, Collider, and these others, OKX whatever. OKX account. Um, yeah, you need an OKX API key, and that's you just dump that into the hedging module, and then it just operates on its own, right? Is that you just need a you just need the API key, and that's the only thing you've got to configure, right? Um, it's touched on essentially, I guess, the, the crux of this is like price discovery and USD. So, like, obviously, I guess the, the holy grail would be essentially a liquid enough decentralized exchange where you can just, you know, people can just have the liquidity to set the price. But how, since it's modular, in your opinion, how easy would it be if, like, you, if an exchange was cut off, OKX was cut off from having USD bank account, like, how hard would it be to implement like a bridge currency, like, where essentially OKX can't trade BTC for dollars, but they can trade BTC for euros, and then they can they can then go like on FX markets. Like, so how, how hard would that be to implement like, within this? So the reason why I got like really into this was because Arthur Hayes, who's right about a lot of things and really, really wrong about this, um, wrote a new article talking about synthetic USD called Dust on Crust. And in it, he kind of goes through, and there's like a, thing here called Bitcoin. The reality is that we already have a decentralized alternative for exchanging value that curbs the risk of central banking. It's called Bitcoin. Stable coins aren't meant to serve as yet another decentralized store of value. Again, their purpose is to bridge the gap between centralized and decentralized finance. Or in our case, is to bridge the gap between people who use dollars as their unit of account and people who want to use Bitcoin as their medium of exchange. Right? 
But after he has this correct identification, he goes down here and he comes up with this thing called the Satoshi Nakamoto dollar, the Naka dollar, which is going to be like a DAO and an ERC-20 token and a bunch of exchanges are going to be like a federation or all this kind of crap, right? It's like, you don't need any of that. You just need Bitcoin and a place to trade it. And the place to trade it, because you want the execution uh, uh, level for it, of you want it to not have any slippage between the prices and stuff, right? Is that you use centralized exchange because they can give you the best order execution, right? Eventually, decentralized exchanges, if they grow, will have better order execution. Although, if I'm not mistaken, I believe, Paul, you have an article explaining why that will never happen for a decentralized exchange versus a centralized exchange, that the centralized exchange will always have better execution. If I'm not mistaken, yes? I have a lot of commentary on all of this. All right, well, <laughs> have you talk about it later. So, but um, yeah, but basically the, way that, the reason why they use these centralized exchange right now is because like, in doing this, you do get slippage and you do lose some of the price for it. That, that, you open your mouth for a second. Yeah. Like, I, I'm really excited to talk about this with you later because like, I really respect all your writing on this one. Yeah, I have a, long, a long time ago I had a way to use zeros instead of two trades, there's only one, and you only need Bitcoin, and you only need the Oracle, so the Oracle problem. There you go. Uh, you know, yep, that'd be fantastic. And so, like, the way that this is built, right, on the hedging side of things, instead of pointing at a centralized exchange, if you're using, like, a DLC or whatever it is that you're doing for, like, a single trade or whatever, you just point that at that one, and then, like, you can kind of do some thing, potentially, right? But so, yeah, so, but this is why uh, I really got annoyed with this stuff. And this is like the kind of like the big takeaway from my time at OKX, right? Is that like none of their ideas have any standing because you can all do all of it on Bitcoin, especially once BIP 300 gets activated, raise B, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Is that all of this stuff you can do on Bitcoin. You don't need the shitcoin. You don't need the DAO. You don't need any of this other crap. You just need Bitcoin for it, right? And so I think this is an interesting design space. I'm really excited to like, if anybody else wants to work on this stuff, I'm going to be like starting on doing it for a Fediment module. But I think this works really great as a Core Lightning plugin too, right? Or um, as a BDK, uh, just kind of a wrapper around that one, right? Like, I think this is a really, really cool place that we can do this, especially because they will come for the banks. And when they come for our banks, like this was like the experience that I had when I was on OKX, right? Is that there was no alternative. It was, if they shut down the banks, we have no plan, right? And so while there are trade-offs associated with this, this is better than nothing. And that's why I think it's interesting to explore. Okay? So that's my time. Cool. Thanks everyone.